We are just delighted to have Sue Morse here with us tonight as part of Northeast Wilderness Trust's 20th anniversary spring speaker series. And we're so honored to be co-hosting this event tonight with the Mad River Valley Bear Initiative, which we'll hear more about. Um, Northeast Wilderness Trust is a regionally focused land trust that works to protect forever wild landscapes across New England and New York. Um, and we do this for the bears, for the newts, for the fungi, and for people to enjoy these wild places. Um, so we're really glad to have you here to learn more about bears, their life cycle, and how we humans can live more harmoniously with them. And so I'll pass it over to Joe to share a little, Joel, to share a little bit more with us about the Mad River Valley Bear Initiative. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, I'm Joel Rhodes with the Mad River Valley Community Bear Initiative. Uh, we formed in November 2021 to address the growing black bear concerns in the Mad River Valley that we've been experiencing over the last few years. Volunteers include members of the Fayston, Waitsfield, Warren Conservation Commissions, as well as the Moortown Recreation Committee, Friends of the Mad River, Stark Mountain Foundation and the Sugarbush Resort Safety, Environment and Wellness Committee. Our goal is to increase the Mad River Valley community's understanding of bears to help us all take steps to be active stewards of this iconic species. This initiative is creating a centralized education and resource center for the Mad River Valley community to learn more about the Vermont black bear and develop a community bear ethos about how to live and protect bears and increase the community's understanding of how human actions impact and affect bear behavior. To help us all be more bear aware, this webinar is part uh, of, our speak of our own speaker series over the next several months. Uh, and with the help of the Mad River Valley Chamber Steward MRV program, we've launched a Black Bear informational website at uh, madrivervalley.com slash steward MRV slash living dash with dash bears. Uh, we th uh, thank the Northeast Wilderness Trust for the opportunity to co-host this event there with us. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Sophie. Thank you so much, Joel. And I also want to send extend a big thank you to the Larson Fund who provided critical funding to make this presentation happen through Keeping Track, which is Susan Morse's um, organization. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Susan Morse, who is an ecologist, professional wildlife tracker, educator, and published author. She is the founder and science director of Keeping Track, which is a nonprofit that serves to engage communities in monitoring wildlife and their habitats. Teams that Susan has trained have conserved more than 40,000 acres of land throughout North America. Not a small feat. And we will get into the adorable, fascinating lives of black bears and a couple other black bear species. So I'll pass it off to you. Bear. Great. Well, I am really honored to be here. Uh, and, and I feel like I'm among so many friends, not, not just the Northeast Wilderness Trust, to be sure, but, but all the various members of the Mad River Bear Initiative are, are, are folks I know in a variety of ways. So I'm thrilled, really. And this is one of my favorite critters. We, we love our bears. I think most of us do in, in Vermont and elsewhere here in the Northeast, and for that matter, across their vast habitats from Mexico to the subarctic and even the Arctic in places, the black bear is, is a friend. Um, and so I really applaud this initiative to think about how we can get along with our neighbors and and steward them and just just be better neighbors ourselves. It's what we do out there that, that makes all the difference for bears. And the Jonathan uh, Z. Larson Fund has, has uh, made this program possible tonight. So again, I wanna echo what Sophie has said. So, and bear hugs to uh, the people mentioned here for their uh, help with various technical aspects of of uh, cataloging my photography and, and helping to make these programs. So bears are one of Vermont's biggest and you know, I like Joel's word, iconic of wildlife species. They really command our attention and respect and I would hope in most of us our love. 
They're big animals. A great big black bear male could tip the scales at over 700 pounds in really super, super good habitats, say, for example, such as Pennsylvania, interestingly enough, with its abundance of oak species, uh, or Manitoba, interestingly enough, where bears have become enormous. But typically they're, you know, anywhere from 125 to 200 pounds for a female, maybe a little more, give or take, and perhaps as much as uh, over 300 pounds or even 400 pounds for a big boar bear. They're great swimmers, and really, they're really good at what they do in their habitat. We'll, we'll learn about that because that's part and parcel of their survival out there. Right now, they're doing this. Right now, they've come out of their dens and they're finding the things that they can eat that provide nutrition. And uh, willows and uh, any tree that makes or shrub that makes catkins, uh, these, are, these are early spring foods that bears uh, love and, and eat. And so this is uh, part of the menu if you're a bear, willow. And uh, uh, this is the uh, balsam poplar catkin. And these are all flowers. And it'll surprise people to know that bears eat a lot of flowers. And I'll be doing an article for Northern Woodlands uh, in the coming year uh, looking at all of all the animals that use flowers for food. This is a tree out in the Northwest. This is the red alder, a cousin to our speckled alder, although this is a full size tree. And look at those claw marks. That's caused by bears that climb those trees in order to access these catkins. So throughout North America, we see the theme again and again, spring foods, flowers. As uh, the season progresses, young bears are using trees for security while their mothers are wandering around the forest floor trying to find what things are there to be had. Um, and we see sign of bears using trees, and I'll revisit the subject again and again. In this case, using trees to access foods. Uh, and then later on, we'll learn about using trees for security habitat. But this is uh, cherry, black cherry, for example. And these are claw marks that tell us that a bear in late summer, probably August or perhaps even early September, climbed that tree in order to get to the fruits in the uppermost parts of the crown. But then they're always pulling down saplings to themselves. And uh, they eat, uh, for example, uh, uh, eastern hop hornbeam. They, they're, they're eating the leaves, the new baby leaves of hornbeam, which are very nutritious. And again, those catkins can't help themselves. And so if you're a careful bear tracker, you'll be looking for evidence of bears having used those younger plants. And you can see the claw scars that happen. These have aged, so they're not, uh, you know, they wouldn't look this way when freshly happening. But you can find this sign if you look for it. They love young beech leaves. They're like that first green salad we just can't wait to have. It's, it's just great food. Uh, and again, look for evidence. I, I was with Jonathan Larson on his property when I found this and showed it to him. He was fab. He was uh, enchanted by it. Hop hornbeam, I mentioned earlier, very, very nutritious foods in the hop hornbeam leaves. And then they get out into the wetlands, and this is a wilderness scene in the Adirondacks, and that's why I love the Northeast Wilderness Trust. We need more of this rich wilderness habitat throughout the Northeast for bears and for all wildlife and, and for ourselves. But notice the green there. Those are greening sedges, and bears will wander out in that and eat them like cows eating grass. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that a great percentage of what bears are eating, especially in the spring and early summer is, is, is vegetable matter, you know, leaves, uh, flowers, roots, uh, you know, uh, baby, baby uh, sedge leaves like these. Uh, they wander right out in the water and they're cooling themselves. They're still wearing their heavy winter coats. So this must feel good to them to get out in that water and both dine and keep cool. This is a uh, chocolate colored phase of color phase of black bear. This is the chocolate black bear. We see these animals out west, not here in the east, but he's been eating sedges and he's wondering what in heck I am. <laughs> and this is what he likes. Boy, that sounds like a plan. 
they have to eat you know over a seven month period of active foraging they have to eat a whole year's worth of food and store it on their bodies for those months when they're when they're uh, hibernating so to speak but actually technically they're just dormant they're they're uh, they're uh, in a deep sleep, but they're not technically hibernating, hibernating like a, a, a woodchuck, uh, but they're very active. They love uh, in the West and, and parts of the South, uh, all the, the skunk cabbage uh, uh, species that have these wonderful flowers, they eat them. They love dandelions. And, uh, you know, right here in Vermont, you just go right out onto the frosty meadows and sometimes you'll see where warm bear tracks burned tracks into the frostiness of the grass, but wherever they walk, all the dandelion heads are missing. And that's how I happened to take this picture. They love clover and uh, lots of things love clover. So if we're doing forestry management projects, we wanna remember to seed our log landings and daylighted roads with uh, a conservation mix that's strong to to clover because uh, everybody from turkeys and porcupines and snowshoe hares to bears eat clover. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, here they are. That's spring food again. Of course, as you can see, mom's accompanied by her little ones. And when those little ones were born to her in January, just a few months earlier, uh, you know, they might have been eight, nine, ten inches long, and they might have weighed, you know, eight, ten. 12 ounces. That's how tiny they are. And they're altricial and they're born uh, in that state because they're easier for mother to manage both in terms of her food production for them in her den, not eating or drinking anything, but also behaviorally. You know, she can't afford to be dealing with babies that developmentally are getting themselves into trouble. But boy, when they come out of their dens, and this is in late April or May, actually May, uh, in this picture, uh, they 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 weigh a lot more than eight ounces, and they're just little ro little little rogues. They're running around mm. being baby bears. This is something I actually discovered. This is uh, what I call a babysitter tree, and babysitter trees are by definition big conifers with a ladder-like spacing of branches and evergreen foliage in the crown for concealment and for thermal relief, hot sun uh, or rain, you know, the cubs can be somewhat protected in that environment. And it is here that the cubs are, are basically gonna hang out, wait for mom to come back and collect them. And it is up in these trees that they're safe from enemies, which include dogs, people, coyotes, historically wolves, and other bears. And so this is a babysitter tree in Montana that I monitored. And uh, it's not easy for them the first couple of times climbing up a tree, but they soon figure it out. And later on, I'll show you uh, how they climb. But and when they uh, when their mother comes back, she will she will make vocalizations that are very particular to calling them down and having them join her on the forest floor right there at the base of the tree, which is often snowless because the sun will reach in and warm that that pine piney ground and that dark bowl of the tree and and uh, the cubs will nurse and for the rest of their lives they will associate great big conifers with safety and comfort and they will use those trees again and again throughout their lives males and females alike will seek to rest by big trees this is how they climb they grasp with their four paws out to the side and their hind feet are directly beneath them. And they're kind of pushing and pulling at the same time. And depending on the speed with which they wanna get up the tree, they can either gallop up the tree or simply walk with a three point contact at all times. <laughs> I, I promise not to do very much of this at all, but I really feel compelled to, to have us all think very, very carefully and deeply about issues that I think are really affecting ourselves, our planet, our birds, our insects, and our bears. And it's a new science. It's called cumulative effects. 
And it recognizes that an aggregate of combined and often synergistic human cause effects negatively impact wildlife and their habitat and other valuable ecosystem services. So these are measured over time and space. For example, scientists now recognize that global scale problems that confront wildlife today represent an accumulation of many separate and seemingly inconsequential cumulative effects that now have combined to seriously threaten life as we know it. Over space and time, global climate change, acid precipitation, genetic isolation, habitat fragmentation, and the bioaccumulation of toxins in the food web are the de deadly result of decades of unregulated cumulative effects. So where we've gone wrong is we've, we've thought, well, this isn't much of an effect and we can take this little bit of habitat because they'll move somewhere else or they can deal with this stress. It's not a problem, they'll, they'll recover. But over time, this stuff adds up and it's deadly. A multitude of stresses we now recognize causes wildlife to experience behavioral, physiological, demographic, and distributional changes. These challenges result, and this is the take home message, in reduced fitness, compromised reproduction, and unnecessary and costly energetic expenditures. So these are all things we need to think about in the Mad River Bear Initiative. As we seek to get along with bears, we need to think about how we can lessen the stresses that we are responsible for in their lives. We all love our recreation. I've done it myself, all of it. I've run through the woods with my dogs. I used to train search and rescue dogs. You know, it's all good. And especially during the COVID lockdown, we learn to love being out there in our various ways. But I would argue that we need to think very carefully about where we can be and should be and can do so relatively harmlessly and where we should not be and where we should stay out so that wildlife can have their homes unmolested. We love our recreation and nobody here, myself included, is arguing that we need to stop this. But going forward, we need to define where we won't be. Uh, E.O. Wilson calls it half earth. Where's that half of Vermont or the Mad River Valley that we citizens are willing to commit to wild nature? That's, that's the bottom line. Habitat loss and disturbances as a consequence of resource extraction, energy development, and even human recreation are known to stress wildlife and change how they use their habitat while seeking their own food and cover resources their denning habitat, for example, their nesting habitats. Birds are losing fidelity to their nests because of too much activity on our part. Okay, enough of that. As we go forward, let's learn a little tracking and interpreting of sign. This is a step-for-step -step bear trail. And these impressions in the ground have been worn in by generations of mother bears and their youngsters walking in the same steps to that big tree in the background. And the big tree is a babysitter tree that I have 20 years of data on, and it gets used every year. Every year, some mother with new cubs comes to that tree and has her bub come stay up there while she goes and feeds in the nearby spring. And up they go. Bears come in different colors. And this is what we call a chocolate black bear. They come in white, blue, blonde. This is a cinnamon color phase, beautifully named. This is, uh, oh boy, that's dark chocolate, I would say, would you? That's dark chocolate. That's bittersweet chocolate, <laughs> I think, for sure. That's my favorite kind. That's in Montana, that picture. What the bear's doing is digging up an anthill, and they'll do that and they'll get her after the eggs and the larvae. And that's that must be milk chocolate. A little lighter brown, very creamy looking brown, especially out in the sun when it's dried off. 
Bears are all about their food. And one of the things that makes the Northeast and Vermont in particular special is the diversity of habitats and as a consequence, the diversity of foods that are there for bears and, and everything else. These are service berries, June berries, they call them, bear berries, all names for the same thing. They're Amelenchia. And they're the ones that are blossoming right now. As you look around traveling uh, over the landscape, you'll see these white blossom trees. And this is the trunk of a service berry. And you can see the bear claw marks on there. This is John Coyer of the Jericho Underhill Land Trust. And he's enjoying the bear side on service berries. Here's fresh bear side on service berries. So here's my recommendation to you. Half of tracking is knowing where to look and the other half is looking. If you know what foods bears eat, look there. You know that they eat pinch cherries. Why wouldn't they? They're an early fruiting tree and you can see those branches up there that have been bent and pulled into a central location. And that's where the bear sat in order to eat the fruit. Here you see that the bear broke branches and bent branches from multiple directions. I will, I will emphasize that that is sign of an animal that did that, not ice storms. Think about it. Ice storms can't make branches come into one another from multiple directions. Only an animal can do that. And look at the size of those branches, powerful bears. And this is a black cherry cousin to the pin cherry. And these trees will be climbed long about late August, early September, get to those cherries before they fall naturally. And this is the work I believe of the female bears that are live and lean and they're determined. They have to get going with getting fat. And they started doing that in July anyway, wanting to gain about a third of their body weight between July and October. But boy, one good way to do that is in late summer and fall, get to the food that's in the trees. Get there first, climb up there, not a problem. And so we see this, we see a lot of this in the Mad River Valley and up at Sugarbush, up at Sly Brook and all that. This is where bears climb these trees to get to the fruits that are in the crowns of the trees. This is fresh sign. And these are what they're after. They're after the beech nuts, but what the knife is pointing at is the husk. You'll never find them in their scat, only the walls of the nut meats. Mm -hmm. So curiously, they have a way of taking their tongue and perhaps their protrusive lips and extracting those nut meats from the actual opening fruit. New and old, this is what we see in country where there's a lot of bear use year after year. These are critical habitats that Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department recognizes as being important to bears. And that defines our conservation purpose. These are some of the biggest bear nests I've ever seen right in my own woods in East Jericho, right up against Bolton Mountain. That one in the center was huge. It probably had, you know, thousands of nut meats in that pile mm -hmm. that a bear could simply sit there and eat, like pouring potato chips into a bowl. Here, the center of the tree was broken many years ago, and it looks like someone took a giant brush cutter up there. That was all done by bears. Some of those branches are over three, three inches in diameter. Now, this is huge, big, big bear nest. Called bear nest because it vaguely resembles a nest, but it's not really a nest, although curiously, uh, the related bears in Japan, black bears, do use uh, tree nests that they construct. So it's kind of interesting. Again, pulling branches from multiple directions. Let your eyes do the walking. If you're out there and you want to be sure it's a bear nest, lie down and look. Look at the branches that you could find on the ground. Those molars and premolars uh, made that impression. No other animal has a tooth and that, that skull will fit right in that impression. Bears have very protrusive lips and a lot of separation between the inside of their mouth and their gums. So this really equips them nicely for extracting fruits and picking fruits often surprisingly gen gently. Mm. Uh, it's a 
misled, I think, to think that bears are just mangling the, the bushes and, and small trees that they're eating to get to fruit. They're actually surprisingly gentle and uh, there's very little damage oftentimes that, that happens. By the way, that is uh, uh, winterberry. Very interesting, beautiful, beautiful plant. They love the viburnums and they love the dogwoods. And so if you if you go through a list in your mind of all of our native shrubs and trees that make fruit, it probably want to include just about everything. They mm. love beaked hazelnuts. They love American hazelnuts, which we have more in the southern part of the state. Wouldn't, wouldn't see that up here, but boy, what a beautiful plant that is. Obviously the raspberries, and acorns, and these these uh, scats are just chock full of the walls, the outer husks of the walls. You'd call them of acorns, and uh, they're you know they're I wouldn't say they're necessarily more partial to white acorns than red. I think they just flat flat out eat them all. And years when we have a good acorn crop, it's really important to them. Uh, mountain ash. And that is something else. Look at that. And bears are really uh, ecosystem engineers, or not so much ecosystem engineers as, as keystone species. There you go. In the sense that they are mm -hmm. truly contributing to the movement, the the uh, and the and the and the germination of dozens and dozens of plants that in turn support dozens and dozens and dozens of other species of bird and mammal an insect. Mm. They, hey, never mind all those thorns. They love hawthorns and they will negotiate that. I don't know how, I don't know. Isn't that beautiful? And they love the hawthorn fruits. And there's proof pudding, if you'll pardon my way of putting it. That's my boot for comparison. And that hawthorn took a ride because the nearest tree was about, I don't know, 100 feet away, but there it was. I call this one raspberry poupee. You ever wonder, you get a little forest opening, a little uh, gap formation in your forest, or maybe there was a little logging job, some selection cutting or whatever, that sunlight pouring down to the forest floor will often result in a profusion of raspberries. And bears, feces are an excellent medium for the germination of plants, it mm -hmm. turns out. And, uh, you know, the scarification and the uh, strat well, the scarification is what I really meant to say. Isn't that beautiful? Viburnum. Nannyberry viburnum. Mm -hmm. And so when a bear eats nannyberry viburnum fruits and then deposits its waste somewhere, it may very well be feeding cedar wax wings some years later, as we see here. That's how nature gets around. Even the uh, common juniper, which is a thought to be very rich in food, is indeed very rich in food. And in really dry years, this drought hardy species is, is a boon to bears and they will find it. If they have to come down to the valley to find it, they will find it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they love, they're not really berries, they're technically cones, but they're edible and they provide nutrition. That's all we need to know. Same thing with red cedar. So years when there's a good red cedar crop, it's not just the birds that are planting these seeds, the bears are. They love raspberries. I mean, uh, strawberries. They're just uh, very high on the menu of, of uh, sought after foods. They're, they're tiny little things, wild strawberries here in Vermont. But bears have all day. They're not like us. They don't have to put the kids on the school bus and they don't have to go to IBM in the morning. They just simply have to eat. And during their hyperphagia, which means overeating, which they do from midsummer on, they're eating 20 hours out of a 24 hour day. So it's all about food. Find the food and you'll find the bear. You'll also find beauty. And this is part of the biodiversity uh, benefit of bears, mm -hmm. what they contribute to us, what they contribute to the world around us.
They are essential. They must be here. It's not up to us to decide that they shouldn't be here because we're here first. We're not here first. These, this is a sketch showing the disc-shaped seeds of viburnum. They're, they're very identifiable that way. They love the viburnums, and there are many of them in Vermont. They, of course, they love our apples, both wild and cultivated. Now, their tracks, that upper track, you can see where the arch is, um, which would be right here. So everybody take your left foot and feel your arch and arch your foot and arch your foot. And that's on the inside of your foot, isn't it? Your arch. Well, if you were a bear, it would be the opposite because this big toe is not a thumb toe at all. It's a big toe on the outside of the foot. So it's a, it's a left foot for sure. But it, it's counterintuitive because of that big toe. We want to think that that's, you know, let me put it another way. Look at that track and arch your arch. If you were a bear, your big toe would be where your little toe is, the opposite of us. Denning, they'll den in a variety of structures, even under old logging slash or a pile of fallen down trees, brush. Uh, tip overs, as we see here, providing they can get into a chamber that won't fill up full of meltwater. And uh, they're really good at finding places where they can be uh, out of harm's way. This is in the spring, and this bear came out of her den, which was under the tip over, and got on top of the tip over mound just to rat rest. They're not very hungry at this point, and there's nothing to eat really. So there's just a lot of resting and lolling about that goes on at first. Here's another huge hemlock log that I found in my woods probably 45 years ago. And what caught my eye were the, uh, the, uh, the claw marks. The bear was marking before entering the den. And uh, where the red vest is, is where the bear crawled in. But then it hooked to right and went in under the length of the log about five feet before it got to a chamber. And that's where it spent the winter. So that's what catches your eye sometimes outside of dens is evidence of what we call scent marking. This is foraging for colonial insects, in this case, probably carpenter ants. And bears are uh, essential parts of nature's demolition team in terms of uh, reducing dead and dying material to materials that will contribute back to the forest. That's really quite neat. And uh, we call it grubbing and they'll grub open rotten logs, especially if there's some moisture involved. And this is what they're after. They're after not so much the ants, but the, the uh, larvae, the eggs. <laughs> this one's covered with sawdust. So again, look for the claw marks. If you see a log that's been torn apart, go investigate it and see what you can find. Same thing with this log. I was with Lynn Rogers and I said, hey, Lynn, come back here. You walked by this, what do you think? And he said, oh, it's a bear. I said, you bet it is. It popped that great big hassock sized boulder right out of the ground to get to the insects that were underneath. It will eat hornets. It's not after honey. There's no honey here. It will eat the, the colonial insects, eggs, and larvae. It will even eat snow fleas. Now, they're not very big at all, but collectively, if they're in a mass like this, an aggregation of snow fleas, the bear will lap that up. It's protein. Um, we see this more out west, but occasionally you see it here where they'll strip down bark like banana peels and use their uh, incisors on the lower, lower part of the jaw and scrape upwards and eat the cambium. That's what those marks are. It's called cambium feeding. It particularly happens to conifers. And yes, they uh, will uh, kill and eat no newborn fawns, especially when they're in the hider phase and they're just waiting for their mother to come back and nurse them. And they're programmed to be very, very, very still 
but bears that get good at this uh, learn to sort of wander in zigging and zagging forest foraging mode until they bump into a fawn. And, you know, it's heart wrenching, but when you think of it, that mother bear has young of her own and, and that's what makes the world go round, I guess. It's curious, they eat the contents of the intestines first. They do this even with an adult uh, deer, for example. Most fawns get away, not a problem. Bears are a problem, but it does happen. So now we're gonna think about us and our relationship with bears and what we do out there, what works, and what doesn't. Well, certainly food storage is a key element of sensitivity to ways in which we sort of set bears up for trouble that they get into. But it's not that they wake up in the morning and say, boy, I'm going to go in, get into trouble today in downtown Warren. No, they, they're, they're responding to what we have done that carelessly puts them in harm's way. Dumpsters, open dumpsters like this one are a no-no. Uh, you can see the teeth poking up through the edge of that dumpster lid. And that was closed and locked shut, but the bear was trying to get into it. The smell of the food was too powerful, too enticing. And our developments, you know, we name these places after what we've ruined. I tell you, the elk aren't enjoying any heights here nor are the bears. And so here again, we citizens in our communities and in our counties and in our state and in our country and in our world, we really need to make a commitment immediately to defining where we are going to be and where we are not going to be. And that's why I love the work of the Wilderness Trust. That doesn't mean we can't go there and enjoy it, but permanent human infrastructure in those places should not be encouraged. Oh, look, you can get a rustic ranch with phone and internet and all that, but ask the bears what they think. Oh boy, bears, when they get into apiaries, they could do thousands of dollars worth of damage and anybody caring would certainly feel uh, some sympathy for the beekeepers in this regard. But there are ways of totally avoiding this. We're talking 100% efficacy. If you surround your bees with electric fence, you're not gonna have a problem with bears, period. And that is an obligation, I think. And uh, you know, gone are the days when we can engage in our various agricultural uh, endeavors and, and, and not feel any sense of responsibility for doing it right so that we keep wildlife out of trouble. We, we, we've just got to do that. That's the price we pay for living. Yeah, we love our bees and we love our honey, but we also love our bears. Now, I think towns really ought to work with beekeepers and find ways uh, to, to make, make sure this happens. Bears, you know, they're, they're really timid. They evolved with trees. So Early on, they figured out that the way to get away from trouble and enemies is to run up a tree. Not so the brown bear, the grizzly, and certainly not so the more recent uh, evolutionary adventure called polar bear. Those bears don't do trees, but black bears do. So as a consequence, black bears really are timid and wary, and they're not out for a fight. They're not out to encounter us, quite the opposite. If you give them their space, they will go their way. So if you encounter a bear, the best thing to do is to stand still and let the bear choose where it's going. 99, 9 tenths percent of the time, it's not going towards you. A fed bear is a dead bear, and I've, I've put together a list here, which you now have, will have permanent access to with this program, but these are all the things that go wrong for bears. And I'll emphasize the second one, bird feeders. Anybody that's got a bird feeder out now should put it away immediately. It's just going to cause bears to get into trouble. Same thing with open containers or even trash cans with lids on of pet food or livestock food, obviously garbage. Uh, all these things uh, cause bears to get into trouble. And a lot of it can be avoided or, or certainly 
minimized by us. If you use bear spray, well, the first thing I'll say is don't over rely on it. The best thing is common sense. The best thing is being aware of your surroundings and, and, and not putting yourself in harm's way by, you know, walking through the thickest, thickest woods beside a riparian area uh, without making a lot of noise. And, uh, but if you use bear spay, just make sure you're not downwind of it. A lot of people have gotten into trouble with that. It's, it's more about what we don't do. We don't put out bird feeders at the wrong time of the year because they attract bears. And who can blame them? So uh, if you come out onto that porch, getting ready to use your barbecue grill, and this is what you confront, you're going to think, oh my God, this bear is really dangerous and mean and nasty, and this bear's got to be destroyed or gotten out of here. But really, you're to blame. Camping, food inside your tents, worse still, food deep down in your sleeping bag where mom can't find it is a no-no. I took these pictures probably 50 years ago. They're old, old, old scans and they're really crummy, but <laughs> there was something about that sleeping bag that that bear was into. <laughs> so this is an area that I've done a lot of research uh, with. It's, it's called scent marking and it's communication. And no two animals scent signature is the same. And uh, so each animal has his or her own individual scent, which they set down in the environment in various ways in order to communicate. This bear is very aware that some bear grabbed onto that young tree. Now watch this nose. Is that wild or what? The bear is all about olfaction, and to me, this picture really nails it. The bear is all over that young sapling that apparently got touched by another bear. And they will often use their tongues sometimes to further uh, collect that scent. But the scent marking is about really two main things. There's some other possibilities in there, but I've not been convinced myself having studied this now for almost 50 years that some of these other things are necessarily very important but clearly the most important things about scent marking is to simply say i'm here you go your way i'll go mine let's not fight let's not encounter one another so here i am in space and time at 5 15 on tuesday and so another bear can encounter that and adjust his or her behavior accordingly and so it's a it's a way of keeping peace uh, but of course the rest of the time it's about i'm here i'm joe i'm awesome i'm sexy i think i got together with you two years ago i know i didn't help with the cubs but what do you think so uh there's bonnie <laughs> the mad river valley i hope she's in the audience enjoying this many years ago it's uh it's fascinating. And they basically will mark by biting and rubbing and clawing objects to uh, create a, a substrate that is both visually conspicuous by virtue of the, of the uh, mark, uh, but also the scent that it contains is there to be interpreted by another bear. They, my research has helped me appreciate that uh, more than 76% of the time, bears, when they mark trees, mark four species, white birch, balsam fir, striped maple, and curiously, red pine. We don't have a lot of red pine in Vermont, but boy, if there's a natural, not plantation, but natural stand of red pines, or even an individual red pine on a ridgeline, it will be marked. You could take that to the bank. Out west, other conifers have a similar importance. Uh, these conifers that get marked will get very sappy, the wounds, and we'll often see hairs sticking to the sap where the bear rubbed his or her back or chest. They really like those white birches. Interesting. Yeah, this is at Wolf Run where I live. That's a big boar bear. 
And you've seen these, you've all seen this out in the woods. What causes that, a bunch of stray bullets? No, she's pointing at two sticks that are coming in towards one another from two different directions, telling you that those marks were made by opposing teeth. So that's what we see here. This woman is holding my skull up to a bite and that's what she's revealing. The upper tooth on the right, on the upper part of the skull, hooked in and anchored, and the movement of the lower jaw is what made the bite. So here we see it in the opposite. The upper tooth is on the left-hand side of the picture, and it's anchored, and it's not going any further. It's just bit in, but the action of the bite, watch, will occur when the lower jaw closes. I call this, well, my students call this Bear Morse code in my honor. And I, I discovered all this years ago by taking my skull for a walk. And so here's a double one, two in a row. This isn't four teeth doing it all at once. This is two bites, first one, then the other. Now, how do you know those are bites? Well, if you're out there in the woods and you see what looks like a dot opposite what looks like a dash, put sticks into it. If they come at one another from two different directions, those were made by teeth. Females do a lot of this. Uh, they, in the spring, early, early, to announce their uh, imminent sexual receptivity, will, will walk down uh, young saplings, especially conifers by the water's edge, by wetlands, and sometimes climb uh, somewhat older ones and break the tops and drop them to the ground and stomp all over them and rub themselves on them. And so here again, the broken top of the tree, months and months, months later, still shows us her fur that's clinging there. See, that boy is looking at that. So the broken top of the spruce or the fur will have bear hair on it, not mm -hmm. moose hair. Moose hair do this too, but for totally different reasons. They're just eating. How are we doing? 618. So power, power line poles, especially the, well, not especially, in, exclusively, the creosoted old fashioned kind uh, get marked by bears at strategic locations where their trails are coming through, um, uh, often power line quarters that happen to correspond with a ridge line. The pole right there on that ridge line will be marked. And uh, claw marks and, well, you know, bite marks. Okay, remember the sticks, put them in, there they go. <laughs> Children love this stuff, so you bear enthusiasts out there, the best thing you can do this weekend is to get your favorite kids in mm -hmm. tow and get them out there and go find some bear sign. But stay away from the wetland edge, especially if it's wild and remote and has great big conifers beside it, because that's where mother bear might prefer to be left alone with her youngsters. So there's a certain amount of etiquette that goes on. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the splinters left by the linesman cleats will often be repositories for the hair, as you see here. This is a boundary sign up on the Quebec border. And anything that's visually conspicuous in bear's habitat will sometimes simply be marked because it's conspicuous. And bear wants to leave a message there. You see claw marks there. Here you see teeth marks, the upper tooth anchored. That's what we're seeing in this picture. And that hole is created where the lower tooth pierced through the plastic and made the bite. Loggers oil can, PVC piping. I mean, when you find these things in the woods, take your bear skull along <laughs> with the kids. The kids love this. You just give the skull to the kids and they'll do the rest. Trail signs. They even took to putting metal rims around them so the bears couldn't bite them and take them away piece by piece. Now, these are remote camera pictures that I've taken. And this is a female, and this is a mark tree that I have 40, going on 46 years of data. This is a female. This is a male. <laughs> Here's what goes on out there. <laughs> this is a female again. And look at how eager she is. She's going to climb right up to the camera. And then what have you got going on down there in the lower right? Is that a bear? Two bears, two muzzles there. Whoop, 
a little hanky panky going on maybe so i took the kids to that tree after years and years of watching this going on and and reading the sign i said to the kids you know put your hands up on this tree and send the bears a message of love right so this is a picture i took with my camera there it is there's the picture that the camera took aiming down now You'll notice the date on the date stamp at the bottom is August 9th, right? On August 10th, the sow showed up. What? What's that about? Well, I was so intrigued by this that the following year, I decided to try it again. This time I put my hands there and sent the bears a message of love on August 17th. And on the 18th, there's the boar bear. Wow. Isn't he handsome? <laughs> He hoped I thought so, maybe, I don't know. So as I wind this show up, it, it might as well uh, fully, fully explore what we love about bears, period, all bears. These polar bears are massive creatures. It's not unheard of for, you know, a big male poor bear to tip the scales at over 1300 pounds. This is up in Alaska and I'm in a boat using a small telephoto. And uh, needless to say, I didn't linger. And that's their tracks. Huge furry feet. And their soles are largely covered by fur. I think that's both traction and also perhaps some insulation going on. This is a front foot. And then this is in Kaktovik, where uh, the Nupit uh, nation there, the natives, are given permission to harvest a bow whale or two for the village and they take the remains out to a remote part of the island and uh, leave it for the bears and over 30 bears uh, show up and the, the seagulls are sitting behind barbed wire the barbed wire is used to uh, get hair samples from their bears bears so they can do dna uh, fingerprinting and begin to get identities of, of individual bears out there Look at the size of those bowhead whale bones. This is great food for polar bears. It doesn't get any better than this. The sad news about polar bears today is, although we recognize that they are very much in a very endangered state, uh, living dangerously, I'm afraid, in the Arctic that is warming three times faster than any other place on the planet, they are really at risk if the sea ice melts. And for that matter, their high, their 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 dens, uh, relying on permafrost collapse because the permafrost melts. Bears have been killed that way. But th there's another thing going on that we need to be mindful of, and that is, some people, in order to hunt polar bears, run them down with snow machines. So here's where we need to be thoughtful, careful, collegial understanding but we need to work with the world's peoples to, to understand that you know you run that bear down and you shoot it and you take it home and maybe you get ten thousand dollars because it gets sold to somebody in germany who really wants a polar bear literally that's what goes on but what you don't know is the cumulative effects of running these bears again and again and again in a warming world where they aren't even necessarily guaranteed of having enough to eat is a disaster. Shifting gears, we're in brown bear country here. This is uh, Katmai. And I was with one other scientist and we were studying these bears for a couple of days. And we were just, you know, 20, 30 feet on average from them, 50 feet in some cases. Beautiful land, that's columnar basalt. And uh, I, I call this one two cubs at a urinal. <laughs> they really are something. They're, these are the biggest grizzlies, so to speak. They're called brown bears. But because of their diet of so many fish, as well as the fruits that the Northwest offers, they, they get to be enormous. And indeed they do. And their feces are enormous, as you see here. The foods, in this case, elderberry. This is Big Mama. She's got a scar on her nose. She's, uh, I watched her over the course of a day eat 37 salmon. 
37 salmon. She never stopped. She was really good at it. She was the best of all the bears. She had her technique down. This bear thought he was good, but he did a lot of running and splashing and he didn't catch as many fish as she did. Although he caught my breath the way he looked at me like this. <laughs> but this is what caught her eye. This is what caught her eye. These salmon that are, that are, uh, you know, just moving up these wild rivers. There she is. She knows how to catch them. She spends so much time in the water that she gets a permanent part in the top of her hair. Look at that. Down periscope. Yeah, she's good at it. And most of the time they'll 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 rip open the fish and eat the roe first, the, the eggs. That's what you see spilling all over the rocks. They'll eat the head and uh, they'll eat the skin. These are the parts that really are richest in fat resources. So here you see her stripping the skin. Look at all those eggs spilling out. And of course, nothing goes to waste in nature. These seagulls are all about it. What are they doing here? Why are they like this? What's going on? Look what's in the bill of that bird. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Lots of food. Lots of other critters come and partake of the bounty after the bears are done. There's nothing wasted in nature. But, you know, this climate change business is serious. There's a phenological mismatch, we call it, when the timing of interacting species and what they need no longer coincides, no longer provides the resources that one species has been using for thousands of years. And so we're seeing in some places that the timing of the spawning salmon isn't necessarily corresponding as much with the needing availability of this food for bears. It's just, it's a concern. I call this one brothers Karamazov. They were just boof goofing off. They weren't fighting. They sounded like they were fighting, but they're just like dogs wrestling on the living room floor. And this is Big Mama, my mother bear that I was with all day. Now, she finally stopped eating. And I want to emphasize the word finally. And she went off into the edge of the woods and I, I felt real sorrow because I thought, well, that's the last I'm going to see of her. I'm going to miss her. But I needn't have worried because she turned around in those woods and she came to the edge and she lay down where she could see me. And that's what she's doing here. Wow. And she even slept in my presence. Wow. So we love our bears, but we really need to define how we're going to do it now. Going forward, there's, there's a whole bunch of rules that we need to identify and follow. No exceptions. I call this one wet guy. Kids love finding bear sign. Like I said, get out this weekend, go find some. Kids are all about that. They're good at it. It's all about food. What can we do to enhance and provide for the many, many, many foods that bears require? In this age when we're losing whole species because of insect epidemics like out west, white bark pine and limber pine and you know chestnut blight and beech bark disease the list is on and on and on what can we do to protect and enhance the availability of these foods for bears and for everything i call this one hairdo <laughs> i call this one bubbles that's a brown-faced black bear in northern minnesota mm. So keep the wild wild. And that's my concluding message today. That's the best thing we can do. We can define in our communities, in our homes, around our farms, in our state as a whole, how are we going to do half earth? How are we going to do 30 by 30? By, by 2030, what's the 30% we are going to put aside forever? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Here, here, keep the wild, wild.
Thank you so much, Sue. I learned so much. I just love that bears eat flowers. That is so yeah, yeah, sweet and yeah. surprising. Yeah. And that at the bear, um, at the babysitter trees, that they've been walking the same footsteps for so long. Some it's of them. Just... Not all trees have that, but mm -hmm. when they do, it just really is a powerful experience to say the least. Wow, that's really just incredible. And so we have some time, everybody, at the end for some Q&A. So if you have any questions for Sue, you can put them in um, the Q&A at the bottom, which is a different uh, bubble than the, um, than the chat box. Uh, I'm just going to look and see um, what questions we have so far. Um, we've got some folks saying that, um, oh, We've got some folks saying they've been noticing bear marks on lamp posts, and um, someone saying that they have seen the bear like scratching their back on the lamp post. So is that more of an itchy back, or is that a scent marking? You know, it, I I don't think anybody should uh, sink to the level of, of absolute arrogance to say we absolutely know mm -hmm. but i think it's fair to say that it's largely scent marking uh -huh. and, and you know it feels good too so yeah <laughs> great so our first question comes from christine um who has heard that uh this uh whether I'm not sure whether it's fact or fiction that black bears in the northeast are more dangerous than southern Appalachian black bears mm -hmm. is that an accurate perception are there differences no I, I think the one generalization that I'm comfortable making is that black bears that become habituated by us and associate us with food wherever they are they're the ones that are most dangerous mm -hmm. and there was a case of that in Arizona at the top of uh, uh, the Catalinas, uh, Mount Lemon, where a woman had been feeding bears ice cream and got them oh, real used to that. And there was a child that was killed by that bear. Oh, just gosh. showed up for some ice cream and all there was was a child in a tent. So, oh, gosh. you know, uh, bears that come to associate us with food lose their natural fear of us. And that food is so important. Yeah. So, so more about the, um, the behavior and life history and the choices people are making than any particular yeah. regional distinction. The generalization I will make, however, is that parks that are very heavily used by people with lots of opportunities for mm -hmm. food to become associated with bears and vice versa, those are probably more dangerous than your wildest wilderness. Mm -hmm. No question about it. Yeah, and I really so, appreciate the that not only are their human interactions impacted by our individual choices of bird feeders and camping, but also by what places we choose to set aside and protect as wild. Yeah. So um, Catherine is wondering whether there's any knowledge about whether bear populations um, are being impacted by the increase in ticks, proliferation of ticks. If there is, I'm not aware of it, but it's a good question because we know dogs, for example, that are sort of distantly related can get Lyme disease. So, yeah, that's a very good question. I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that, but uh, it's a real one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do we have any data on whether black bear populations are increasing or decreasing over the past few would, or several decades? Well, I, I would say going back to the the 60s and especially the early 70s when I first moved here, bears were still bounty. Mm -hmm. So bear numbers were down because bears were being killed repeatedly, mm -hmm. often and you know, again and again. And so once that stopped and the Vermont's Fish and Wildlife Department had the caring and the wisdom to say, this is a terrible thing, let's mm -hmm. stop this, um, they have, have been increasing uh, their numbers. I think like bobcats, bears are increasing their numbers in part because the diversity of foods, while we've lost some foods to tree diseases and things of this nature, uh, the regrowing forest and all of its diversity of species and age classes of species has made for quite a bounty of food. I mean, bears, bears didn't, in my woods, have access to turkey eggs. Mm -hmm. Bears eat turkey eggs. Mm -hmm. They are known to 
kick the birds off their nests and eat oh the okay. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, so, but having said all that, I think there's an opportunity too, where if you're like me and you welcome and embrace the idea of forest management, but you also welcome and aggressively embrace the idea immediately now while we have the chance of wilderness on the forest management side of things there's millions of things we can do in mm -hmm. the forest and for that matter on the edges of our farms mm -hmm. those field edges mm -hmm. where all those shrubs and and understory trees grow that make that food we can stimulate the availability of those things and i think we're going to need to because i think you know, if we lose speech, I, I'm, I'm hoping we won't, you know, you yeah. just have to anticipate that there are things happening in the plant kingdom all around us that, you know, we, 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 we need to counter that in some way by being creative. Mm -hmm. and, and so management can be good. Mm -hmm. Wilderness is absolutely good. So mm -hmm. we, we need them both. Great. Um, and for folks who want to go find some bear marks, where can they look to best be able to find bear marks in their local area? Well, certainly evidence of feeding. Like I said earlier, repeat after me, everybody, half of tracking is knowing where to look. The other half is looking. If you know bears climb beech trees, which are smooth and gray barked and scar readily, mm -hmm. Find yourself some beaches in some wilder woods. I wouldn't think, you know, I wouldn't think Letty Park in Burlington would be a candidate, but certainly you don't have to go far in the foothills of the Green Mountains and, you know, in Richmond and, and uh, Jericho and uh, Starksburg, all the way down the whole Green Mountain Ridge. Those foothills are prime time for bears. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is get out of town just enough to where bears can have their absolute security habitat away from us. Mm -hmm. They don't do well if they're constantly surrounded by us and our activities. We know that. Space is important. And speaking of our activities, we've got some bird feeder questions. Oh, yeah. So of course, I love looking at birds and I get to see so many more when there's a bird feeder out. And I know I'm sure a lot of you on this call do. So do you have tips on like, for folks who still want to have a bird feeder when the best time of year is to do that and then also if you take your bird feeder in at night is that effective to deterring bears or is that not quite enough yeah i i dare say there's it's an extremely rare person with a very very eager beaver vacuum cleaner that's going to completely clean up mm -hmm. all of the seeds and leftovers from the feeders having been fed from so since those things are still on the ground, the effect of your bird feeder is still there. And it, it should also be added that the, the habit of the bear coming there is going to be there for mm -hmm. some time. In other words, you can't, I mean, especially in a, in a season when we have a relative food failure in the form of the nut meats and fruits that don't happen because of late frost or don't happen because of drought or don't happen because mass sometimes is that way it just chooses not to happen right that's a disaster for bears and it's especially hard on on uh, young bears uh, going into their den with their mothers for their second winter if they haven't had the benefits of tremendous amounts of food all summer long so that they can both grow and invest that food energy in growing but also maybe put some weight on mm -hmm. they're in trouble those mm -hmm. are the bears that get hypothermia and malnutrition the following spring Ugh. because they're going to lose a third of their body weight in their den. so those summer so, months are so critical that's why food is so critical mm -hmm. and that's why we need to do whatever we can to give bears all the opportunities they need to eat food without eating our food mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of wild food, do they eat frogs and other amphibians at all? Do you know about that? I have never seen evidence of it. I, you know, I, I don't know. That's a very good question. I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know, when they're grubbing, if they should encounter, a, 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 you know, a, a spotted salamander, they might eat it. I mean, they eat just about everything else. So I don't know. That's, I've never seen evidence of it. So I'm, I'm not going to insist on that one. Yeah. Yeah. How about how about foxes? Do you, do you know anything about their interactions with foxes? Do they care about each other or just ignore each other? 
That's an interesting question. I, I know cats certainly interact with foxes, both domestic and wild. There does appear to be uh, mm. the fox is, is keen to notice the availability of a food resource that the cat has caught. I don't know that um, there's. Yeah, okay, no. interesting. That's cool to yeah. know about the foxes yeah. and the cats. Yeah. So you were just speaking, speaking about younger bears not getting enough food in the first season and going into hibernation and coming out undernourished. Um, Alexis uh, is sharing something local that happened in Warren, Vermont, in the Mountain Valley. They say our local warden here, game warden, I assume, here in Warren said that food for bears often goes in two-year cycles. So on those off years with the mass, bears sometimes go into hibernation very undernourished. And that warden recently got a call about a starving bear in Moortown. With climate change and bears emerging earlier throughout the year as spring gets warmer quicker, what are your thoughts on how that might affect things? Yeah, boy, emerging earlier, as long as there are plant foods that are emerging earlier and there isn't, you know, a mismatch, uh, probably on, on the spring side of things, it's not a problem. Um, as for the cycles of masting or the availability of foods that have that uh, that remarkable cycle of abundance in some years, overabundance in some years, normalcy for many other years, and then a bust, total bust. Uh, what I've seen looking at beach, that seems to be happening in more like mm. five or six or seven year cycles. and. I'm not a mathematician and I haven't haven't really kept exact statistics on this, but um, the theory is that masting happens so that when there's a super amount of fruit being produced, often by multiple species, it kind of gives the plants a chance to say, OK, reproduction, A plus green light, we're going to do it. There's no amount of seed predators or fruit predators out there that are going to overwhelm us. We get to have our day in the sun mm -hmm. and that's all good. And then what about the seed predators like the squirrels, for example? What happens in a mass failure is that limits squirrel numbers mm -hmm. and kind of keeps things in check. So there's sort of a flow. And um, I'm curious that he talked about two years. I'm sure he's thinking in particular of a certain kind of plant. But again, we think in a in a biodiverse state like the state of Vermont with the abundance of foods that bears eat and foods in particular that make fruit for bears there's a lot going on mm -hmm. and uh, so researchers in Maine actually uh, noted what they call reproductive synchrony where abundant bear cubs and abundant fisher kits and abundant numbers of marten kits hmm. all corresponded with abundant mass the mm -hmm. year before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind that of makes cool. sense. Yeah, yeah, and I could also see, um, you know, as climate change and the phenological synchronicity is changing, sort of in the moment that maybe research on how earlier springs etc might affect bear hibernation might be starting now and we might accumulate that data in years to yeah. come possibly yeah well yeah and then we've got a couple life cycle questions what's the average lifespan of black bears and how many cubs does can a female have well in a hunted population where bears are are, are taken by hunters the lifespan would be less especially in areas that have access, uh, you know, or, or can be accessed by roads and trails. Um, wilderness areas offer bears somewhat more of a break in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, bears in captivity, collared bears. There was a collared bear that I actually met in Arizona back when I was doing cougar research there, and she was 27 years old, mm -hmm. and she had a collar on. So wow. it it really varies. Bears. Uh, and, and cats too, for that matter. If they're in habitats where they're not easily hunted, they live longer lives, mm -hmm. for in, sure. Including like mountain lions. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So that's a, a consideration. Great. And we had one extra question about bird feeders. Is it recommended in the winter to take down bird feeders when the snow is low or absent? 
Well, theoretically, and again, you know, animals are animals and they're going to break the rules whenever they <laughs> feel like it, for, no matter who made them. Uh, you know, I, I think bears are apt to come out of their dens in winter because they've been disturbed by something. Mm -hmm. They've been disturbed by a heavy thaw with a lot of freezing rain and rain that flooded the den, something like that. But generally speaking, they're, they're, they're hardwired to stay put. And especially the females with cubs of the year, they can ill afford to be wandering around out there. The reason being is that from an energetic standpoint, there's nothing out there for them in the winter. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And so they're better off. They use more energy to try and find food under those circumstances. So I feed birds in the winter, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. But, but the minute it's moving towards spring and spring is earlier now, it used mm -hmm. to be, I felt comfortable that if I took everything down by the second or third week of March, I was safe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have some remote camera pictures of bears that are out there in March. Right. Things so are I changing. Know, I, I, I don't want to say that absolutely, but it is curious. Yeah. 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 Um, Actually, in one of our earlier webinars, you had mentioned, we have a question about whether COVID has been found in bears. And I know in an earlier webinar, you mentioned that, that it is very high in deer populations right now. Do we know anything about it affecting bears? I don't know uh, of it affecting bears. I know that it, you know, when when the original COVID first reared its ugly head, we, we, we saw that it affected zoo animals in the Bronx mm -hmm. Zoo. And more recently, I think starting in Ohio, they learned that deer uh, could contract COVID and actually catch it from us and presumably give it back to us, which is a very, very uh, perturbing concept. Um, I don't know about bears. I, you know, this is uh, the one of many, many unanswered questions, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, for our last question, we've got a funny experience from Robin, who says that a couple weeks ago, a bear went into their shed and took out several, a dozen pounds, I'm sorry, a dozen bags of wood pellets, and the bear shredded the plastic bags and, like, strewed about the pellets, and they're saying, you know, there wasn't any bird seed, um, so it seems kind of strange. Do you have any thoughts about why that kind of since what happened? A bear was a juvenile delinquent. I don't know what to say. I've never heard of such a thing. I, mean, sometimes <laughs> I have a cat at home that will go on a rampage and just destroy something. Just okay. For the sheer, you know, power of doing it. I don't know. Uh, maybe the bear had had a positive experience ripping, ripping open bags of oh. livestock feed uh -huh. and kept thinking, well, mom showed me this. I remember when I went with my mother and we tore into those bags of, yeah. uh, you know, of, uh, but this doesn't taste that way. I'll keep looking. I don't know. Yeah, that's, no, that's, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah. Mom, or just had a really bad day. Yeah. And needed some punching bags. <laughs> yeah, right. okay. Wild guess. Well, this has been a delight. This has I been really, really fun. Help. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. We so appreciate it. Well, um, okay. I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody who joined us did as well. And thank you everyone for being here. We had almost 200 people joining on a gorgeous sunny evening. So we're really delighted you're here. And again, we're going to send a follow-up email within a week. It'll have this video recording. Um, yeah, and next week's show. Yep. And we've got a show next week with Sue as well. Um, that will be wild animals we thought we knew, and it reveals some new exciting research that um, explains more about animals and uh, debunks some myths, um, some preconceptions that uh, might not all be actually true. Uh, so you can tune in, uh, you can register for that on Northeast Wilderness website and join us again for another evening with Sue next week. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a lovely evening. And um, thank you for bearing with us. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's great. <laughs>